Hi, I'm Stephen Hand of the Stakata School of Defence, uh, which is across several states of Australia. We're one of the world's oldest HEMA clubs. Uh, I've been uh, looking at surviving fencing manuals uh, since the, 19, uh, the early 1980s, and I've been seriously dissecting them uh, since the early 1990s. And one of the things that we've looked at in a lot of detail is sword and shield and surviving evidence for how people fought with sword and shield. So I was really interested to see the um, video by Matt Easton uh, on the subject and I agree with quite a bit of what Matt has to say, uh, disagree with some other things. Uh, so hence this video. Now, one thing that I definitely agree on, Matt says uh, there are no early period sword and shield treatises. Now he's certainly correct there and in saying that we can never be 100% sure exactly how Vikings, Saxons, Normans fought with their shields. Um, Mac looks at the available, available evidence that people use to reconstruct these systems of swordsmanship and he does a fairly good job of, uh, of, of gathering together that evidence. We have quite a lot of illustrations, we have some descriptions in sagas, Arthurian romances, what have you, um, and we have a bunch of later period fencing manuals. We have Italian 16th century sword manuals. Uh, Matt mentions Manchelino 1531 and also 1536. I would add in uh, Agrippa 1553 and De Grazi 1570. All of those manuals have sizable sections and very useful sections on sword and rotella. The rotella is a two, two and a half foot round uh, shield which is strapped to the arm. Now, there are also um, a set of 15th century illustrations and descriptions uh, of fighting with sword and sometimes with club and dueling shield. The best of these uh, manuals is Talhofer, his 1467 manual, and they describe uh, German judicial combat with a, a large, roughly six foot by two foot shield with a, a centre grip, a big pole centre grip down the, the middle of the shield. Uh, Matt speculates about how much these types of combat might have been like early, early period uh, combat. Um, where I think he makes a mistake is that he looks at them in isolation. Uh, he doesn't look at them all together and compare the 15th century sources with the 16th century sources, with the illustrations, with the saga descriptions. Um, and that's where I think uh, we could maybe go beyond his, uh, his assertion that we really don't know uh, how people fought with sword and shield. Now, when I first got involved in um, historical European martial arts, I really didn't look too much at sword and shield because um, the main periods of sword and shield fighting that I was interested in were Dark Ages, Early Medieval, uh, and we just didn't have uh, sources for that, and I really didn't think that the 15th, 16th century material had, uh, had much to tell us about how Vikings, Saxons and Normans fought. And it wasn't until quite a few years later that my student, um, my then student and now uh, a very accomplished instructor in his own right, Paul Wagner, uh, came to me one day and he had some plates out of Talhofer and he showed them to me and he said, well, would they have used these dueling shields the same way they'd always used shields or would they have come up with a whole new way of fighting with uh, shields just for dueling shields. Um, and I found that a really intriguing question. And so what I, what I immediately thought I needed to do was to go away and look at other source material. I needed to go away and look at the 16th century manuals. I needed to go away and look at illustrations. So I went away and I, and I hit the books. And the first thing I did was I looked at every single illustration of sword and shield combat that I could lay my hands on. And all up, I, I've looked at quite a few thousand images of sword and shield combat uh, over, the, over the years. What
what I found was, well, yeah, it does appear that people held their shields and used them in the same way that we see in the 15th century German Fechtbooker. When we look at Taubhofer, we see the shield being used in a particular guard. It's called the, I've christened it the outside guard. And the edge is held towards the opponent. And when we look at illustrations uh, from earlier periods, yeah, we see a lot of mass combat pictures with the shield held flat against the body. Um, in shield walls, but when just about whenever we see people in single combat, the shield is held with the edge out from the body, as shown in Talhofer. And I'll put up an image of uh, Talhofer's dueling shields. We can compare the pictures from Talhofer with illustrations from earlier periods. Uh, what I'm about to show you are pictures from, uh, they're also pictures of, of judicial jewels, but these ones are French from the 12th century, and they show people holding uh, round shields with a centre grip, so very like Dark Age Viking or Saxon shields. Uh, and in the first illustration that I'll show you, they're holding the shields overlapping, engaged, like in Talhofer. Uh, edge towards the opponent and in the second one they're holding the shields the same way but they're a little bit further apart and the shields aren't engaged. The next image that I'm going to show you uh, is of two ordinary combatants. Uh, and these guys again have got round shields. They're actually held in uh, two straps. It's sort of like a, a, a pseudo centre grip. Two straps held in the hand. Uh, large round shield like a Viking or a Saxon shield. Uh, this one again is 12th century French. Uh, although these guys look like they could be off the Bayer tapestry. Uh, and again the shields are very definitely held edge towards the opponent just as we see in Tower Hopper. The next image is again a 12th century French one. It's a picture of Goliath. If you look closely, you can see uh, the sling stone hitting him in the forehead. He's got a kite shield. Uh, once again, as with the earlier, earlier image, it's held with two straps uh, in a centre grip. And this again is being held edged towards the opponent. The next image I'm going to show you is uh, shows how far back uh, the, the shield guard dates, the outside guard. Uh, this is an image uh, from the first millennium BC. It shows a Celtic warrior. There are quite a few images of Celtic warriors holding their shields in Talhofer's outside ward. Uh, and it shows that the same guard position was held by warriors literally for thousands of years. We can also see the same uh, guard positions shown in the Italian sword manuals and their sword and rotella sections. Uh, Marozzo, uh, 1536, is very interesting. Marozzo shows the shield held flat in front of the body and says that if you're up against multiple opponents, particularly those with spears, you should hold the shield flat against the body. Uh, but he, he then says that if you're up against a single sword-armed opponent, you should hold your shield out and shows a guard uh, that is almost identical to that shown uh, in Talhofer. We also see that same guard, the same outside ward, held by de Grazzi. Uh, and I'll show you an image here of de Grazzi's guard. And we can also um, see that same guard position being held as late as the 18th century. Donald McBain in his manual from 1728 shows exactly the same guard position. 
we don't just see images uh, of the guards being used, the guards that we see in Talhofer. We also see images of the basic techniques. One of the most common techniques used in Talhofer is when the shield is turned from an outside guard into an inside guard, although it's done by stepping around the shield rather than moving the shield around the body. And this is clearly shown in Talhofer, as you can see in the next image. Talhofer's inside ward is also shown just as his outside ward is shown in historical images, so is his inside ward uh, shown parrying attacks. Uh, the image I'm about to show you is 14th century French and shows a knight bringing his shield across to the inside uh, to parry an attack. We even see the inside ward being used quite late. Uh, I'm about to show you an image uh, taken from a painting of the Battle of Culloden. Culloden was in 1746. The painting was made just a year after in 1747 and clearly shows a Highlander turning his shield to the inside to parry a British bayonet. Not only is the inside ward shown in historical images, it's also shown and discussed in the 16th century uh, Italian sword manuals in their sword and rotella sections. Uh, De Grazia in 1570 writes, the defence of the high ward at sword and round target. For the defending of the thrust of the high ward, it is most sure standing at the low ward and to endeavour to overcome the enemy by the same skill by the which he himself would obtain the victory. In the very same time that he delivereth his thrust, a man must suddenly increase a slope pace with the left foot, beating off the enemy's target with his own, and driving of a thrust perforce force with the increase of a pace of the right foot. And with this manner of defence being done with such nimbleness as is required, he doth also safely strike the enemy who cannot strike him again because by means of the said slope pace he is carried out of the line in the which the enemy pretended to strike. So, in other words, what he's telling you to do is to step forward and left, slope pace, to turn the shield to the inside ward, knocking aside the opponent's shield and enabling a thrust behind the shield. The same parry is described by Agrippa in 1553 and Agrippa is good in that he also illustrates it uh, and you can clearly see the inside wall parry being done in the illustration that you're about to see now. Now, what did we do when we um, collected all this information together? Well, it's very interesting that uh, Matt mentioned um, people who've been working on Sword and Shield. He mentioned, uh, in particular, Roland Borzaka and um, mentioned the excellent work that Roland's been doing on um, reconstructing Sword and Shield. What he didn't mention is that Roland's material, Roland's quite explicit about this, is based on work done by myself and Paul Wagner. In 2003, uh, Paul and I published a paper in Sparta, the Anthology of Swordsmanship, uh, and it was titled uh, Talhofer's Sword and Dueling Shield as a, uh, as a Model for Reconstructing Early Medieval Sword and Shield Techniques. And in it, we laid out most of the information that I've relayed to you, in fact, quite a bit more information. Uh, and we went on, uh, well I went on by myself to write a second paper in Sparta 2, which came out in 2005, and that was titled Further Thoughts on the Mechanics of Combat with Large Shields. And in the first paper we basically outlined the material that I, I've, I've talked about, uh, what Talhofer said and how we can see it in uh, 
earlier medieval images and how we can see it in the Italian sword manuals from the 16th century. In the second paper, I looked at a few things like the, uh, the critical angle that the shield has to be held at. Uh, it's not held straight out. It's certainly not held flat against the body. We're told specifically not to do that. It's held out at a fairly steep angle. Uh, and we can actually see that uh, in the better drawn images all the way from earliest times. We can see it on ancient Greek vases all the way up to the 16th century. Uh, I also wrote a big section on uh, hoplite warfare, on uh, how the, uh, the Greek hoplite shield, the hoplon of the Aspis, uh, was used, and had a look at how curved shields are used. Now, curved shields are a bit of a different beast. Uh, curved shields can't be used exactly the same way flat shields are used, so all of what I'm telling you is about how to use flat shields if you want to look at how to use curved shields the Sparta paper. And when we look at all the surviving evidence for how shields were used, we see a remarkable uniformity. Yes, we're told sometimes we need to hold the shield flat in front of our body if we're up against multiple opponents. We're not sure which direction the attack's going to come from. But uniformly, we're told when we're up against a, a, a single opponent that we should hold the shield out from our body in the outside wall. It doesn't matter whether we're looking at Talhofer, whether we're looking at an image uh, from medieval Europe, whether we're looking at uh, Agrippa de Grazzi, Marozzo, Manciolino, they all basically show the same thing. And it doesn't seem to matter whether the shield is strapped to your arm, whether it's held in the centre grip, whether it's six foot, a six foot by two foot dueling shield, whether it's a roughly three foot, uh, uh, three foot diameter, round shield, it doesn't work for curved shields as I said, it also doesn't really work for bucklers, bucklers are a different beast. If I have a buckler, I can only cover one line, a high outside line, high inside line, low outside, low inside, right? And even then, not particularly, not particularly well. Most of the sword and buckler sources tell you to parry with the weapon, then trap with the buckler, such as 133. The shield is a different beast. If I've got the shield, I'm, if I'm an outside ward, I'm covering high outside line, I'm also covering a low, low outside line. If I change to an inside ward, I'm covering a high inside and a low, a low inside. So shields work fundamentally differently to bucklers. So in conclusion, uh, what have we seen from everything I've shown you? Uh, Max suggested that we don't really know how people fought with early medieval shields. I would suggest that we do know. At least we have a first approximation. We don't know the minutiae. We don't know all the little details. And Max talked about the concept of frog DNA. This comes from Jurassic Park where for some inexplicable reason they filled in the missing dinosaur DNA with frog, with frog DNA. Um, obviously it wasn't a biologist who thought that one up. Um, but it was a term that was then used by Greg Mealy of the Chicago Swordplay Guild to describe the way everyone interpreting historical fencing manuals fills in the inevitable gaps with a little bit of material from another manual or sometimes just from trial and error. Now Matt suggested that we might have 5% frog DNA in, in an interpretation. Um, I think he's been remarkably generous to any interpretation of um, sword and shield. If we're looking at something like silver or um, fiore, capo ferro, where we've got a really detailed manual with a lot of, a lot of information, yes, we may be able to get it 95% correct. We may only have 5% stuff borrowed from other manuals or extrapolated from what the manual does tell us. We may only have 5% frog DNA. I reckon conservatively with sword and shield, yes, we do know broadly how they were used. We do know that the same techniques and the same guards are shown century after century with remarkable regularity. 
but we don't know the minutiae. We've probably got at least 30 to 40% frog DNA. All right? So we've just got to get out there and use the shields. We've got to use the guards that are shown in Talhofer and the Italian manuals. We've got to use the basic parries that are shown, again, in Talhofer and the Italian manuals. Uh, but from there, we really do have to extrapolate a, bit, a little bit because we don't have a manual showing us how Vikings or Saxons or Normans fought with, uh, with their shields. So, if you want to look at how sword and shields were used, um, try and get copies of our work. Now, unfortunately, with the collapse of Chivalry Bookshelf, uh, both volumes of Sparta uh, are reasonably hard to get. Uh, I've still got quite a few copies of the original Sparta. I don't have any um, extra copies of Sparta too. Uh, I'll be trying to put um, stuff that's unavailable up on a website somewhere in the um, near future uh, for people to access. Um, and essentially what I'd like to say is that we have sources for how people fought with sword and shield. We know roughly how, we, how they did it. If you're basing your material, what you're doing, if you're basing your system of sword and shield on Talhofer, on the Italian manuals, on the illustrations that we see, yes, you've probably got 30 to 40% frog DNA. Um, there's a lot of extrapolation involved. However, if you're basing it on anything else, you've got 100% frog DNA. Essentially, you're just making it up. Right, because all of the available source material shows us that in single combat, swords and shields were used in one way. Right? And that's the way shown in Talhofer, that's the way shown in the Italian manuals, that's the way illustrated in practically every illustration of sword and shield combat that you can lay your hands on through the centuries. Okay? So if you want to look at sword and shield, that's what you should use. Hope this has been useful.